Good evening, everyone. Welcome to NTD Tonight. I'm David Lamb, sitting in for David Zhang. Here are today's top stories. An Italian Air Force precision team flew over Southern California ahead of July 4th. It's part of their North American air show tour. The Thompson Fire continues to burn in Northern California. More evacuation orders and July 4th fireworks canceled in the area. People in Texas and Mexico are getting ready for Hurricane Barrel as Jamaica reels from the damage. First up, an Italian Air Force precision team flew over the Las Vegas Strip before July 4th. The team was heading to the Los Angeles area as part of their North American Air Show tour. An Italian Air Force precision demonstration team made a colorful green, white and red flight over the Las Vegas Strip on Wednesday as part of a North American tour headed to Los Angeles and Huntington Beach, California for the U.S. Independence Day holiday. Italy's Aeronautica Militare team is known as the Frecce Tricolori, or Tricolor Arrows in English. It compares with the U.S. Air Force Thunderbirds, which are based at Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas. The Italian team flew Wednesday over the Grand Canyon in Arizona and refueled at Nellis as part of a 2024 North American tour, including nine events and 17 flyovers. According to its commander, the tour of the U.S. and Canada is the first by the Italian National Aerobatic Team in more than three decades. Flights are scheduled next week over the California cities of Santa Barbara, San Francisco, and Sacramento before heading to Canada. Returning to the U.S., displays are scheduled July 27th to 28th in Chicago and Milwaukee, followed by flights and events in August in cities including Philadelphia, New York, Washington, D.C., and Boston. We'll have more 4th of July stories in the second half of our program. But first, let's take a look at some other top headlines. Governors who met with President Joe Biden at the White House yesterday expressed their support for him. Here's some of what was said. It was a great conversation with the president and the vice president because it was honest. It was candid. Uh, I, I think that, you know, we always believe that when you, when you love someone, you tell them the truth. And I think we came in and we were honest about the feedback that we were getting. We were honest about the concerns that we were hearing from people. I'm here to tell you today, President Joe Biden is in it to win it. And all of us said we pledged our support to him because the stakes could not be higher. Office. The president has three and, a half, three and a half years of delivering for us, going through what we've all been through. Uh, none of us are denying. Thursday night was a bad performance. It was a bad, uh, it was a bad hit, if you will, on that. But it doesn't impact what I believe. He's delivering. More than 20 governors from Biden's political party joined him in person and virtually at the White House. The meeting lasted over an hour. The governor said they expressed concerns about Biden's performance in the recent debate, but they didn't join other Democrats in urging him to leave the race. As we head into the July 4th weekend, extreme heat warnings are still in effect for much of the West Coast and Southern U.S. The National Weather Service has issued warnings for 11 states, including Arizona, California, Nevada, and Texas, where temperatures are expected to hit triple digits. Excessive heat warnings are already in effect in Oklahoma, Tennessee, East Texas, Mississippi, Arkansas, and Louisiana. Warnings will start on the 4th and extend through the weekend in Arizona, Nevada, Oregon, and Washington. Temperatures in the 90s are expected in Utah, Colorado, Pennsylvania, and several other states. California's Bay Area is seeing record-breaking heat, with warnings lasting through next Tuesday. This heat wave could bring the longest stretch of extreme temperatures in nearly two decades. A judge has blocked a Biden administration rule that adds gender identity protections to health care. Fifteen Republican-led states brought a lawsuit challenging the rule. The Department of Health and Human Services finalized the rule in May. It was set to take effect tomorrow. It says a prohibition on sex discrimination also includes discrimination against people who identify as a different gender. Some states opposed the new rule, saying it would force their Medicaid programs to cover puberty blockers and cross-sex surgeries for minors. Many states have banned such treatments for minors. District Judge Louis Garola said Wednesday the administration 
administration overstepped its authority by interpreting sex to include gender identity. An update on the California wildfires. The Thompson Fire continues to burn in Butte County as a heat wave sets in. Officials ordered more than 28,000 people to evacuate in Northern California yesterday. Governor Gavin Newsom declared a state of emergency for the area. Authorities say the fire has burned more than 3,500 acres with zero containment. Entity's Jeremy Sandberg tells us more. More than 28,000 people were under evacuation orders in and around Oroville, California on Wednesday. Cal Fire says four firefighters have been injured out of the more than 1,400 firefighters working under extreme heat. The agency said eight helicopters, numerous air tankers, and nearly 200 fire trucks were on the scene. A Cal Fire spokesman says it will be a challenging week. Triple digit heat, red flag warning, heat warnings, and July 4th. And unfortunately, people are going to use fireworks. 95% of fires in California are human caused, therefore preventable. State officials say the Thompson Fire broke out in dry vegetation on Tuesday, about 70 miles north of Sacramento. Cal Fire says the cause is under investigation. The California State Parks has canceled the city's 4th of July fireworks celebration as fire crews try to keep flames from reaching more homes. State park officials said a community fireworks show will be held at a later and safer date. Oroville's mayor said there was a significant drop in fire activity Wednesday and was hopeful some residents could soon return home. The state's largest fire, the Basin Fire, covered nearly 22 square miles of the Sierra National Forest in eastern Fresno County and was about 25% contained. More than a dozen other small fires were active across the state. Authorities are urging people to follow evacuation orders and stay informed through official channels. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Hurricane Barrel remains a dangerous Category 3 hurricane as it pulls away from the Cayman Islands. Rainfall in Grand Cayman is approaching the dangerous rate of one inch per hour, which could cause flash flooding. Here's more on the forecast and impacts. Hurricane Barrel is soaking the Cayman Islands with sustained winds of 115 miles per hour. The storm is expected to lose additional strength as it journeys through the Gulf of Mexico on Friday. According to the National Hurricane Center, it will likely be a tropical storm before intensifying to a Category 1 hurricane as it approaches land. As Barrel pulls away from the Cayman Islands, the good news for those folks is that uh, the hurricane warnings have been discontinued for the Caymans, could still see some gusty winds and heavy rainfall in these showers as they pass through in the outer bands to the east of Barrel Center as the storm moves quickly to the west-northwest away from those islands. It's forecast to make landfall along Mexico's northeastern coast or in southern Texas Sunday night or Monday. But Barrel is already a deadly storm. It, it was a scary experience. And when you look at like um, houses, concrete houses just fall to the ground, it was like something just out of the world, you know? It was just unbelievable. Everything is gone. Everything you can think about is gone. People are homeless, they need food, they need water. The storm has killed at least nine people in Jamaica, Venezuela, Grenada, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Based upon the category of hurricane that hit us, uh, it hit us at a category four, uh, the damage was uh, not what we had expected. And so we're very grateful for that. But there was damage nonetheless. Uh, we had damage to some coastal infrastructure in southern parishes. We're now in the process of starting the, the damage assessment and the needs assessment, including social and livelihoods assessment. We also participated and supported the Ministry of Labor and Social Security with the packaging of food items, which we hope uh, to start distribution as soon as more information becomes available. Parts of Mexico and the southern U.S. are getting ready as Hurricane Beryl heads northwest. Forecasters expect Beryl to spend most of Friday in the Yucatan, likely weakening over land, and could then pick up power in the Gulf of Mexico. We'll take a short break now, everybody, but here's a look at what we have for you when we come right back. One of the biggest 4th of July celebrations in Orange County featured a spectacular lineup this year. Northern Californians also celebrate July 4th with their parades and music by the bay. 
As people celebrate the nation, let's take a look at which areas were the busiest on July 4th. Those stories and more coming up on NTD Tonight. Welcome back to NTD Tonight. I'm your host, David Lamb. Today, people are celebrating America's 248th birthday with festivities nationwide. Christina Corona is at one of the biggest Independence Day celebrations in Southern California. We're here in Huntington Beach at the 120th annual 4th of July parade, where tens of thousands of people line up along the parade route to celebrate our country's independence. Established in 1904, the first Huntington Beach 4th of July celebration commemorated the arrival of the first electric passenger train linking the area with Long Beach and Los Angeles, drawing 50,000 people to the festivities. Today, this annual tradition attracts over 500,000 attendees each year. From horses to marching bands and even classic cars, the Huntington Beach Parade has something for everyone to enjoy. We asked several people what they're looking forward to the most at this year's parade. Well, we always love the beautiful horses, the Mexican horses. We love all the different bands and, you know, all the floats and we look forward to it every year. I'm looking forward to all of the patriotic flags. I love flags. I love anything that's patriotic. I'm looking forward to my church as a float. And what does it mean to them to be an American? To have the freedom to worship Jesus, um, to have the freedoms that my children and grandchildren have, um, to live in America. We are really one of the best countries. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, limited government. It's great that we get to be in a country where we can be who we want to be and do what we want to do. Another 4th of July parade is in the books as Surf City USA celebrates America's 248th birthday. If you're out celebrating tonight, have fun, be safe, and happy birthday, America. Christina Corona, NTD News, Huntington Beach. Now let's take a look at one of the Independence Day parades in Northern California. Earlier, I went to a 4th of July parade in the city of Alameda. The red, white, and blue parade in Alameda, California is said to be the longest in the nation with a route of 3.3 miles, 2,500 participants, and 60,000 spectators. Happy 4th of July! Happy 4th of July! The city of Alameda in the San Francisco Bay Area held the parade, which attracted more than 160 parade entries and drew in crowds of families and patriots from afar, as well as locals. Come out and support our wonderful community here. It's nice to, to see the police and fire departments uh, <laughs> connecting with the community and nice to see that, that everyone appreciates them. Uh, we're not in Lake Tahoe today. My son's on a championship float and he's uh, got a bunch of championships under his belt. So we, we're here for that. Families out together and the, the diversity, the, how fortunate we are to have such a diverse community. What's the best part of uh, 4th of July for you? The parade. Yeah? yeah? What's your favorite part so far? Uh, candy. Candy? All right, what about you? Fireworks and candy. Candy. All types of floats and groups united at the parade, including animals, performers, car lovers, bands, and more. What does 4th of July mean to you? Traditions and a reminder of all of the blessings that we have and to revisit the basic principles of freedom and independence and to think about what that means uh, individually and as a community and as a country. And I would say people coming together and celebrating and just enjoying 
each other's presence. For me, um, it's just the feeling of that independence and then uh, grow, I grew up in the Philippines. So I've learned the history of this and to celebrate it here actually in America. It's such a privilege to do. It reminds us of the resilience that we have as a community. So we, we need reminded of that. I sure wish uh, we would adhere to the Constitution the way it was written and the way these guys uh, structured it, but uh, yeah, we won't get into politics today, just enjoy the holiday. July 4th, also known as Independence Day, is usually celebrated with parades and fireworks to commemorate the United States of America since 1776. In Alameda, California, David Lamb, NTD News. Millions of Americans across the country have been gearing up to celebrate, which can make certain places crowded as we've seen. NTD's BJ King tells us which activities get the busiest on the 4th of July. Independence Day is known for fireworks, parades, and crowds. These are the locations and activities that get busiest around the 4th of July. If you're looking for professional fireworks shows, amusement parks such as Disney Parks, Universal Studios, and Six Flags usually host special fireworks shows for a couple of days for the holiday. Such shows bring lots of visitors, so you can expect an increase in foot traffic and attendance, especially around later hours when the fireworks start. National parks have historically experienced large surges in visitors around the holiday, with 4th of July crowds having filled Joshua Tree National Park to capacity and bringing record numbers of visitors in the past to parks such as Yellowstone. These national parks are also famous campsites, an extremely popular activity around Independence Day. National and state parks have frequently reported crowded campsites and completely booked campgrounds for parks that offer online reservations. Another iconic summer location that sees an increase in traffic and even more so during holidays is the beach. Coastal cities around the country are preparing for huge 4th of July crowds. San Diego expects to see a lot of beachgoers as their waters are popular for boating, personal use fireworks, and general beach fun. Meanwhile, Jersey Shore towns are preparing for large gatherings for fireworks shows and monitoring for any signs of pop-up parties that could occur. As for general road or air travel, this year's 4th of July traffic is set to break records. Nearly 71 million Americans are expected to travel this year for the holiday, with 60 million traveling by car. And the Transportation Security Administration reported a record-breaking amount of passengers going through U.S. airports in a single day, with even more expected to pass through this week. B.J. Kang, NTD News, California. Tonight on NTD, we bring you a July 4th special, Close to Our Hearts. NTD's White House correspondent Iris Tao and Jan Jekelek, senior editor at the Epic Times and host of American Thought Leaders, reflect on Independence Day, their personal journeys to America, and what America stands for. Here's a sneak peek at some moments from their conversation. I was just thinking to myself how like actually I wonder if it's true that Americans don't necessarily cherish these freedoms as much as immigrants do especially immigrants coming from like you know communist countries like Poland used to be or you know still nowadays communist China because I grew up in mainland China before I moved here in middle school and I remember how like back in elementary school middle school like we were kind of like forced to read textbooks with like, you know, propaganda that are, you know, apparently praising the Chinese Communist Party, but also denying um, any human rights issues. And so that's why like when I first came to the U.S. and then when I got exposed to like all the uncensored news about China, what's happening in the Chinese society, how people in the Chinese society are actually living, you know, what kind of challenges they're facing, what kind of like, you know, different problems that exist within the society. I think when I saw that, it was a huge cultural shock to me. Um, and that's what actually prompted me kind of to go into journalism. I grew up as a child of immigrants. I grew up in Canada. The main reason I was in Canada was because when my parents escaped communist Poland, it was easier for them to get papers to Canada. So that's where we ended up, but where they wanted to, where they're sort of, the, the, the pull was of course to America, and everybody knew that, right? It was the dream of freedom, uh, you know, living in an authoritarian, totalitarian state. It was always there. There was this underground railroad that was 
uh, bringing Chinese religious dissidents, Falun Gong practitioners, out from China through the Golden Triangle and into Thailand, into Bangkok, where they could get UN refugee status. So almost impossible for them to get that in China. They wouldn't, that's typically how it works in these systems. You have to get it in the country where you're facing the problem. I wanted to tell these people stories. We were kind of, my wife and I were playing a support role in this, in this system. Stay tuned for China in Focus with Tiffany Meyer coming up next. The first ever victim account of forced organ harvesting in China. A Falun Gong practitioner forced into surgery where parts of his liver and lung were taken. More on China in Focus with Tiffany Meyer at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. That's all we've got for you tonight. We'd like you to join us again on NTD Tonight every weekday at 9 p.m. I'm David Lamb. That's our program. Have a wonderful evening.